Take care. It's good stuff. You guys have heard a lot of really great stuff today, I think. Um, and now it's my turn. Um, I'm Brian Brown. I'm on the board of directors of the NAWAC, and uh, I also produce a podcast called The Big Foot Show. Just to start my ego, who's ever want to listen to the, pop, the Big Foot Show? The Big Foot Show, anyway? Oh, my people are here. Half of those are in the group, but anyway. Um, so I want to talk about uh, uh, what we call here the Valley of the Wood Ape. It's also known as Area X. Uh, we call it that so that you don't find out where it is. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. One of the things that uh, I hear a lot from people is that, why don't you ever take anybody skeptical down there in the area X? You see all these things happen in area X, why don't you make a skeptic down there? I'll, 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 my response is, is well, I'm a skeptic. Everybody in the group is a skeptic. And because I expect a lot of you folks out there are skeptics, some of what I'm going to tell you today is going to be kind of hard to believe. It's, it's, it's almost bordering on the unbelievable. We had uh, some incredible encounters. And if I were to stand up here all day long, I could not tell you all the things that have happened to us in Area X. I've only got a little over an hour, so I'm going to hit the highlights from the last year. But you have my word that everything I'm saying up here happened. We've got some very exciting transitions. Um, so what are we doing out there? Operation Persistence, what we called, what we did last year, uh, we're out there for about three months total. There, it is uninterrupted field study. Uh, the idea is to observe and quantify data. And I've got data in this step. Uh, we believe there to be a primate, and we want to observe it in its natural habitat. This is what naturalists do. This is what scientists do. And it's what we're attempting to do. We collect data through our observations, and then we measure and track that data. <coughs> Woo. So our hypothesis is that there's an unlisted primate in the forests of eastern Oklahoma, in the Washtenaw Mountains. Lives on the ground, it's covered in hair, very elusive. I'll talk to some of some of the uh, misperceptions is that they are shy and always trying to stay away from people, always trying to avoid being seen by people, and that's not true. But they are elusive, <coughs> and they walk on two feet at least part of the time, maybe not all of the time. They live in the washout, as I said. So our primary objective at this point is the collection of undeniable proof. Science requires that any new species, before it is listed, is, is, is to present a, a, a sample of that. It's called a holotype, type specimen. There are some small, a few examples of, of species being listed where that did not happen when they were listed, but in every case, after they were listed, a type specimen was produced. Science requires a type specimen. It is an uncomfortable subject for some people, and it is a controversial point to make, but it is what science requires. There are 18,000 new species discovered every year, and people estimate that there are millions more out there. I know there's at least one more out there. This is from Dr. Gary Casper. He's a wildlife biologist at the University of Wisconsin. It is not science if it cannot be independently verified. Collecting voucher specimens is necessary for that. Moreover, if a population cannot sustain the loss of a few individuals for vouchers, then it is doomed anyway. Conservation is always about the habitat, not individuals. Conservation is about the habitat and about the population of animals, not individual animals. It's a misperception. Conservation groups are not animal rights groups. They are not trying to protect individual animals. They are trying to protect the population of animals and where they live. 
Another doctor, this time from uh, Rome. <coughs> Specimen collections are not only useful yet necessary to the progress of natural sciences and represent an invaluable source of information to understand the tempo and mode of biodiversity change. We don't know what's happening to this population of animals. You know, as Lyle just pointed out, people have been seeing them for years, but we, since there is no data on the population of them, we don't know if there are more or fewer now than there were then. I would be surprised if there were more. There is just no example of an animal of this size that lives in this place in, in, the, in the food chain that has increased in population since man has pushed into all the wild places of this, of this country. So it's very likely that this is a animal that is under stress and under pressure, but we don't know because nobody's bothering to do the basic science that is required to understand the tempo and mode of biodiversity change. This guy's from Norway. He said, not in English probably, it is unethical not to collect for the purpose of describing and archiving. Again, if you care about these animals, then you care about where they live and you care about how many they are. And until they are proven to exist, they cannot be protected. I know that there was a, a quote in the local paper today um, somebody said, some, a notable person in this field, that, that the, the collection of a specimen should be outlawed. And I don't understand. We can have this conversation independently. You and I can have this conversation later. I don't understand how you can claim to care about this animal, to have an interest in this animal, and not want to see it like, recognized and protected. This is our backyard. The Washtenaw Range, eastern Oklahoma, extending into Arkansas. So what we call our laboratory. This is in Oklahoma. Now I'm not from Texas. I'm not from Oklahoma, and people who I live with don't know that this place exists. Oklahoma for them is one big flat thing with you know singing people jumping around, you know, musicals. They, they don't think that there's mountains. <laughs> And, I mean, that looks like Vietnam, right? It does look like Vietnam when you're in it. So, so far, we've been operating in this area for more than a decade, but for the past two years, 2011 and 2012, we had two three-month operations, combined Operation Endurance, Operation Persistence. At our last conference, we presented on Operation Endurance, and I'll be touching on that somewhat, but today is mostly about what happened last summer uh, in persistence. First up, this actually happened in endurance. In an attempt to document the species, we uh, attempted to collect the sample, the specimen, and uh, there was blood found following that event, and uh, we believe that it came from that animal just based on the circumstances where it was found and, and where it was. So we actually had that blood analyzed. This is what it looked like when we found it. It's not very far from where the incident occurred. Uh, unfortunately, this blood was sitting on these rocks in the sun in the summer for multiple days before we found them. So it's possible that this is not the blood from a wooded. It's possible that this is some other blood. But it, it, we sent it to be analyzed because we wanted to know what it was. Unfortunately, the DNA on, in, in these samples was too badly degraded by environmental exposure, and for modern technology, it, it can't be analyzed. We still have two samples that we're holding on to. We actually lugged these rocks out. We documented it very carefully. We took DNA samples from everyone who touched these rocks, so we know exactly. We have a, a complete DNA uh, trackway, so to speak, of everyone who touched these samples. So if it comes back as close to human, we can take those DNA samples and match it against people we know touch these rocks and screen them out. It's very important when you're doing DNA analysis to have the provenance of your sample, to understand who held your sample all the way along. If you don't have that, you don't have a sample. You don't have something that has any, any value. So at the end of Operation Endurance, we came to multiple conclusions, which I touched on in our last conference. We know they're there. Up until last year, we had never seen one there. I'm sorry, 2011, two years ago. We know that prolonged presence is more productive than short stays. 
Previous to that, we would go in for a couple of a couple of days, a long weekend. Um, then we try to get out. The, the understanding, what our assumption was, that uh, when you're dealing with an elusive wild animal, you should have as little impact on its environment as possible. Get in, get out, let it do its thing. Because we were trying to get pictures <coughs> on our game games. What we found was when we stay, it seems to piss them off a little bit. They they, they throw rocks. And they, and they knock wood. And, and this was something that, that a lot of people have been talking about for years, but, but we as a group did not have enough personal experience and data to be able to say conclusively that they threw rocks. Well, now we know they throw rocks. They throw all kinds of rocks, little rocks, big rocks, all kinds of rocks, rocks and big handfuls. They're smart. They are smart. Primates are smart. Orangutans are incredibly smart. And like alpha coyotes, they seem to be aware of, cam aware of our cameras and they can't avoid our cameras. And I cannot explain that. We touched on it a little bit later in the presentation. But it, it has been observed in other animal populations, um, animals that are not quite as smart as primates, that they know the cameras are there and they avoid them. So as I said, this is six months of direct observation and interaction. And we took copious field notes over 11 teams of individuals. It's 11 groups of people, the people, the, the, the members of this organization who basically sacrifice all of their summer vacation, some people for weeks or months at a time to, to, to collect these observations. This is what we looked like last year. So remember these date ranges. Alpha, first team, was in May, late May. And Kilo, the last team, was in late August. So that's basically the time span you're talking about. So when you see other charts and tables in this presentation that are labeled from alpha to kilo, you're talking from late May to late August. In addition to that, we had several smaller trips in. We did some stuff over the winter. We've now been there pretty much every season of the year, and we have had experiences every season of the year. So that's another myth that I'm going to talk about later on. They're nomadic. They migrate. Well, not these. I'm not saying none of them do, but these are right here, and they've been right here for quite a long time. So what we do is we take all of our evidence, our field notes. If you go to our little booth down the, down the way here to your right, there's actually a field note of the, 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 the group that I was with. And you can see our notes, our raw notes, as they come out of the field. Those get brought back. They get edited for clarity. And uh, then they're republished for the group to, 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 uh, to ingest. And then we spend a lot of time talking about what we're seeing. So this is. As I said, this is how science works, and it's, it's the closest approximation we can, as citizen naturalists, pull off. So we have pulled from our field journals 19 behavioral activities, things that we can isolate and say, this is an activity that's different from this one, that's different from this one. And one of the things I get asked a lot is, why do you call them an ape? Well, why, why are they apes? And you're going to see that, that what they do is ape-like. It just is. It isn't bear-like. It isn't people-like. It's ape-like. They do, they do so, there's so many parallels between with how these animals behave and how large primates behave in other parts of the world. We'll start with the big stuff, visual context. As I said, in 2011, we had our first sighting. And during this operation, you'll see that in Team Bravo, we had eight sightings. I was one of them. So we had eight, two more 10. Multiple visual contacts. These are confirmed. I know what that was. It was a big hairy thing on two legs, two arms, and a head on its shoulders. This was not a bear. It wasn't a furry blur. Over here are possible contacts. Things that we just did not feel comfortable enough saying, that is a wood ape that you saw. It could have been a hairy blur. could have been a bear. So we're not going to say it was what we think it was. But we think that in, in these cases, it's quite possible that what we, looked, what we saw was a wood ape. I mean, look at this. Before I get to anything else, th there's a place on this planet that you can go and have these kind of experiences. is is pretty incredible. Rock throwing and wood knocking. I'll tell you that this is, um, these are individual accounts written down in the field journal of, an, of a rock being thrown. And I can tell you that this, this number on, on your left, these numbers on the left, are vastly underreported. Because I was in Bravo team right here. And I remember at one point, and multiple of us did this over the course of the operation, I just wrote down, there's too many rocks coming in for me to even note them all. 
you'll be sitting there, and there's a cabin, and we sit next to this cabin, and there's a mountainside behind the cabin, and rocks come in, and you can hear them like through the leaves, and then boom, onto the cabin top, and they roll onto the ground. That happens again and again. Again, little rocks, big rocks. Well, maybe they're nuts falling out of the trees. Well, nuts do fall out of trees. I'm not saying they don't. But nuts aren't this big, and they're not made out of granite, you know? And somebody asked me, well, maybe it's raccoons. Okay. So these are raccoons with packs on their back. They're loading them up with rocks, and they're climbing up into the trees. And then they're taking them out, and they're chucking them down. That's a smart raccoon. That would be better than it would if a raccoon that could do that. Wood knocks. Again, this was something that we were uh, suspicious of. We, 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 weren't so, we weren't comfortable enough to say that we knew they did it going into Operation Endurance during persistence. We know. We know, that we know how they use them. They use them for, for location. You'll hear them over in this direction, hear a knock. Over here, you'll hear a knock, and then you hear a knock over there. All boom, 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 boom. Like, where are you? I'm over here. I'm over here, too. We'll also hear wood knocks just before our trucks enter the compound and just after they leave. So you'll be sitting there, and you know someone's coming in, and you'll hear a knock from the direction of the road. A few minutes later, you hear the truck. That happens again and again. It's not one time this happened. This happened multiple times. And then the reverse happens. Someone will leave. They'll get in the truck to drive out. You can't hear the truck anymore, and you'll hear a knock. They're announcing. Somebody's coming. Somebody just left. Vocalizations. We've heard... How many people here are familiar with the Ohio Howl vocalization? It's a fairly famous, uh, purported Bigfoot sound. Uh, we believe it is. We've heard this sound uh, in X. We've heard sounds that sound like the uh, Tahoe scream. Who's heard the Tahoe scream? Yeah, we've heard that sound as well. We've heard other sounds that we can't explain. Aren't barred owls, aren't coyotes. We've heard chatter. <coughs> Sometimes on the internet you'll hear this referred to as samurai chatter. If you've heard the uh, first Sierra sounds disc um, that was recorded in California, uh, it's not unlike that. I used to dismiss the Sierra sounds because it was unique. I had not heard anyone else present that kind of, of data before, that kind of evidence. So the Sierra sounds were always something I just dismissed because it was unique. Well, it's not. I, I've actually I've heard our own recordings of those sounds that we collected during endurance. Sounds very much like the Sierra Sounds. They, they sound like they could have been out of the Sierra Sounds. We've had multiple members hear that. Kathy Strain, who was up here earlier, actually heard that during the Bravo team. Heard whistles. Simple whistles. These are not birds. You can tell the difference between a whistle coming out of a, out of a mouth and the sound of a bird. We know what the birds are sound like. We've been there a long time. These are whistles. We'll hear whistles one night during Bravo Team, actually, this whistle right here. This whistle was responded to by this weird sort of popping clucking sound. Like, but like with a really big mouth, right? It was loud. We didn't really know what it was. We had not heard that sound before last summer. And now we've heard it lots of times. Obviously, you can see at the end, once we had attuned to that sound, Look, I got laser now. Once we attuned ourselves to that sound and knew what it was, we realized that we were hearing it more often. Don't know what that is. You're going to hear, uh, you're going to see a video that is Mark McClurkin, who had a very close encounter with a big old Woody, where he responded to a clucking sound. We call it a clucking sound. I, I mean, it's a pop. We're trying to come up with a good word. Cluck sounds like a chicken. It doesn't sound like a chicken. It's like, so he was, he was sitting in a blind, and, and we'll, get, we'll get there in a minute, but he responded to that, and he was, he was, there was a very negative reaction to that. Let's just put it that way. Smashes and crashes. Big sounds of trees. Sometimes it sounds like a whole tree is coming down. The trees fall down in the forest, so we can't, we can't, I mean, do trees get old? They rot, they fall down. That happens. So we can't assign all of these to what a behavior. But we hear it a lot. If, fall, if trees are falling down this often in the forest, they'd all be falling down by now. Hear branches cracking, big, loud, just snap. You just hear it pulling down. Snap, 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 smash. Just like that. That happens quite a bit. Gorillas do that. Chimps do that. 
That's eight behavior. Rock clapping, very, very common in other parts of the country. You've heard it there too. That is the undeniable sound of rocks being banged together. There is only two animals in that mountain range that can clap rocks together. Us and them, because we have hands. A bear can't clap a rock. Neither can a coyote. Banging on metal, the, the area that we're able to research in, there are multiple sort of um, cabins. And they all have metal roofs. There's a lot of sort of sheet metal around. And they bang on it. You know, they use it. And these are, you know, they could be displays of, of I'm here and I'm bad, right? So be, be aware of me. Um, they could be just trying to see us stir around like ants because they, they enjoy that. I don't know. But we hear a lot of banging on metal. Sometimes it's a rock hitting metal, but other times it sounds like somebody's slapping metal. Slapping on cabins. The cabin that we stay in has been hit numerous times. Enough that some of our members felt like they're going to be thrown out of bed. There was one time the cabin was hit and there, was, uh, uh, there were things on a nightstand, a little table next to the bed, and those things were knocked off the nightstand. I have audio where you can hear this happen. And you can hear, well, I'll let you hear it when we get there. A horse smell. Everybody talks about how bad they smell. And they do smell bad. Uh, like a wet horse, if you know what a wet horse smells like. Sometimes, sort of a urine smell, which is kind of nasty too, but, but more like just a, it's more of a musky, you know, it's not necessarily, I mean, if, you, if you've grown up in, in the woods or on a farm, it's not a bad smell. It's, it's sort of a rich, earthy, sort of just wet horse smell. It's a big, wet animal. And I don't know if they're excreting something or why it happens, but you smell it. And when you smell it, very often, there's some kind of other behavior happening at the same time. It's become a tell for us. Thuds and stomps. I don't think it's unusual that we heard most of those at the beginning because that's when, presumably, one of our theories is, they're trying to say, I know you're here, I want you to know I'm here. So you hear these like big thuds. I mean, sometimes it just feels, it sounds like somebody picked up something really heavy and dropped it. It's a big rock on the ground, just boom. And you can feel it. Clear footfalls, we hear this, they run by the cabin. You're gonna say, well, they run by the cabin, you should get a picture of them. And I agree, we should get a picture of them. <coughs> Don't. We should. Footprints, we found lots of footprints. I have video of one of the footprint finds, actually, in the last team in Kilo, um, that's uh, the video I'm going to show you. And, and unlike a lot of times, see people find footprints. That, and in this, the, the earth here is very rocky. There's not a lot of good dirt. Um, so very often these are shallow tracks. And uh, in this case, it actually shows up on the video, which is why we're showing it. A lot of times you see them, you take pictures of them, and it doesn't come out very well in, in a photograph. Loud limb, branch breaking, I touched on that already. And then this last thing is it's not quite, obviously it's not a sighting, it's not even a possible sighting, it's you're walking around and something really big, real close to you in the woods, takes off. We hear that lots of times too. Can't say that it's wooded, precisely, because we can see it obviously. But when you're walking around, and, the, and you'll see in some of the videos, the, 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 the understory here, the, the growth is very thick. And there literally be something six feet from you and you can't see it. And you're walking along and all of a sudden you're like this. <coughs> that sounds like something just ran away from you. So we put that in the bucket of water. Could have been me. All in all, if you go through just the Operation Persist, just the Operation Persistence journals, 881 events that make up the charts that you just saw. And why do we do this? We do this because it's, it's the foundation of understanding how an animal behaves and lives. That's what this is. We're not out there for the experience. We get some great experiences. That's just the free prize inside with going out there and collecting this data. This is how the data spreads out. You see it's more active in the beginning and more active at the end, less active in the middle. Don't know why. Don't know if it's a heat thing. It's really hot in the middle of summer in Oklahoma, as you probably know. Could be a heat thing, could be all kinds of things, I don't know. So now we're gonna start with the audio. First thing you're gonna hear, as the description says, 
You're going to hear an animal, some kind of animal, huffing and puffing, and then you're going to hear the sound of a rock hitting the cabin. This is from Golf Team. It was in, towards the end of June. Uh, you're going to want to be quiet to hear this. I'll play it a few times so you can get it. Now that was on an audio recorder. We, we've actually heard that too. I don't know if that one was heard by a person. Sometimes these happen, this is two o'clock in the morning. So they happen at night when we're in the cabin and we're trying to get some desperately needed sleep. And I, I'll tell you, there are times when you're in there, you're just like, could you just, could your monkeys just leave me alone for one night? Could you just let me, let me sleep for one night? So I'll play that again for you. And what it sounds like to me, what I hear is I hear something like, a, like almost like a shot putter, like getting ready and then just letting go. And I can tell you that that's off the roof because you heard it roll after it hit. That, that's, when you go out there, our dear leader, Alton Higgins, was up on the roof doing science, clearing the roof of rocks. Look on your roof when you get home and tell me how many rocks are up there. So we, we clear the roof of rocks, then we wait a few days and then we clear it again. You know, the rocks just, they, I don't know, they're, they're, those darn raccoons. <laughs> I'll play this one one more time for you. Now, some people are going to say, well, how do you know you're not being hoaxed? How do you know it's not a bunch of rednecks? Hillbillies out there. I can tell you, it takes a long time to get into that area. It is, it, you know, the greatest defense. We try to protect its location because we don't want anybody going in there for obvious reasons because we're using firearms, we're trying to collect the specimen. Um, but it's hard to get into. It protects itself. You're not going to just stumble upon this area because you, being a reasonable person with street tires on your truck, will have turned around way before you get to where this is. There is nobody there. There is nobody around for miles. I can say that, and all I can ask you to do is trust me on this. There is nobody there. And if there was, let's just play a little what if. What if, you know, there's some hillbillies over the hill that we don't know about that have lived there the whole time. And they're just messing with the city kids, right? We shoot at these things. How often do you think they're going to throw rocks at our cabin? Maybe the first time, but not after that. Two hours on the same day. This is four o'clock in the morning. You can hear an owl just before it happens. And then you hear like a little thump. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's of footfall, you know, as it's running up to the cabin. But my, my impression, and again, everybody's going to interpret this differently, but my impression is they come up. It's almost like a game of chicken. You know, they're sitting up there in the mountain like, I dare you down there throw like a really big rock, right? So they come up, and they run up, and they throw the rock, and then they turn around and run away. Run away. Um, so what that little sound is, it could be the sound of it landing on the ground before it chucks, you know, sort of planting its foot like a pitcher would. Um, or it could be a vocalization. It could be, again, a grunt or something like that. I'll play this sound a couple more times. The owl. And when I say there's a mountainside, in fact, you heard the owl again after the rock. There's a mountainside there, but it isn't like there's a, like a, a leaning cliff over the cabin where these things are just sort of falling down. Um, it slopes away like a regular mountain would. So there is no other explanation for where these rocks are coming from. That's two examples. Again, this happened 
hundreds of times. I, we'd be sitting, you know, so we sit outside the cabin. We sit a little away from the fire, so that it, 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 there's a little tip for you. If you sit around the fire, it's hard for you to see outside the fire. But if you sit away from the fire, it's easier to see eye shine because now you're, you're away from the light source, and if there's something out there with reflective eyes, it'll be easier for you to pick up those reflections. So we sit away from the fire, and then you'll, you'll hear the rocks coming down. In fact, the, the first thing that went in there, we called it the, the little exchange of rocks, the rock war. You hear a rock come in, boom. And you can see the things land. I mean, some of them, you can see where they land. You pick it up, you throw it back. What else are you going to do? I mean, you can't charge up there after it. You could, you wouldn't do much. And then it comes, another one comes in. You pick it up and throw it back. There was a time during the Bravo team where I was coming around one of our trucks. We were sitting outside the cabin. Our trucks were all arrayed around there. I came around the truck, and I heard a very large something eight feet from me. Like, start and take off in the woods. Other guys, two other guys were out there with me. They came up behind me, and as we were, as our attention was focused towards that sound, a rock landed right behind us. They use rocks to distract you. They use rocks to draw your attention. If you are focused on something that is interesting to you, that may be a woody, another one will throw a rock to get you to turn away because they know they have us trained that when they throw rocks at things and it makes a big noise, we turn around like a bunch of, you know, train monkeys. We run over there to see what's up. <laughs> They're using tactics in the same way that a chimp would. Not the way that a person would. The way that chimps. Chimps do this exact same thing. They collect rocks with foreknowledge of what they're going to do with them. And I believe what apes do as well. Here's another sound. This one's a, the, the recording on this one's not so good, but this is uh, in July. Daryl Collier, Kilo team. He heard this while it was happening. Three o'clock in the morning. Very close. And this, this sound is a little difficult to hear, but I, I think you'll, you'll pick up the, uh, what we want you to hear. on a porch. So Daryl is sleeping in a bedroom that the window of is right over the porch. And what you hear is like, it sounds like a monkey. Like, <laughs> and then the rock hits the porch. Let's play it again. Darn monkey, there came up with a cabinet, threw a rock on the porch. And again, I'll say, what else could that be? As a skeptical person, as I hope you are, tell me what else that could be. It could be a hoaxer. It could be a hoaxer. A hoaxer who does not care if he gets shot. A hoaxer who can do inhuman things. That can cut through brush like a deer. Who can go up the hill like it doesn't exist. Who will wear a hairy, furry suit in the middle of the Oklahoma summer. And you know what that's like. Could be a hoaxer, sure. sure. Yeah. Or it's a woody. This is the rain of rocks. This is a long clip. And what you're going to hear, this, this is a new phenomenon. We've only heard this this year. Um, and, and we have multiple theories as to what's going on here. This is not just a rock. This is lots of rocks. This sounds like handfuls of rocks. And it goes on. And what will happen is you're going to say, well, why don't you get up and go look? Good idea. So first time it happened, we got up, we got out of our cot, we stepped on the ground, and the wood floor of the cabin is old and it creaks. You can't sneak out of these cabins, right? And as soon as we got outside, the sound had stopped, there was nothing around the cabin. So we've, we've done that, we've gone out and looked. Now, in the case of this recording, we laid there and listened to it. And this one does go on for a little bit.
And I'll tell you, when, when the team first came back and said this, I, I, I didn't know what they were talking about. I couldn't understand what, what they could mean by a rain of rocks. But that's what it sounds like. It sounds like it's raining rocks, right? And I do believe that the Washita's is where every rock on the planet came from. Because there are a lot of rocks there. They just come up out of the ground. They're, that's where they're created. We're all rocks. It's a font. But I don't think they fall out of the sky. So take that for what it's worth. So this is Derek Collier. And uh, early on in the operation, he had a sighting. He's going to use a few terms here. He says OP. That's the operation. That's where, I'm sorry, the uh, observation point. He's going to talk about a ghost blind. Anybody know what a ghost blind is? It's like a mirrored blind. You put it around yourself, and it reflects the ground. It's very hard to see the blind itself, let alone the person in it. So he's in this OP, in the ghost blind, and he's with another member who's doing maintenance on some cameras that we have going up and down the creek. And he had a sighting, and uh, you're going to hear about it. Um, well, this, this is about uh, seeing O'Gray is what I'm now calling it. Um, Rick and I had gone to deploy in uh, Observation Post 1, which is on the creek, which is where McClurkin had his siding, Travis had his siding farther down. Uh, the plan was that Rick was going to go, I was going to go ahead and deploy, and Rick was going to go and change out each camera while I deployed. And so um, I went to the OP, and he, he started going to the plot watchers. I saw him go to the first one. And then I didn't pay much attention, and I was sitting there for the longest, and I wondered why I never saw him go to two. I just, I guess I just missed him because, to be quite honest, I was a little bit on edge because mm -hmm. I kept looking behind, I kept hearing things behind me. And so my focus was I was trying to be 360 while I was there without my backup. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I... Sorry, so you were in the... I was in the position, in the, OP in the blind, one, yeah, okay. in the ghost blind. Okay which is all the ghost blind units we have set up as a big fort Okay, is what it is. So you left them out there, they're still there. They're there. Okay. They're there now. So he goes and he wor he's working on the cameras. So some time passes. You know, I, I can't remember how long, but it seemed like 45 minutes. And I'm like this, and I'll glance, and there's a figure stepping from a big rock up on the bank. I see white, or not white, but light-colored feet, or light color on the feet, and shh, it's it's a, it's a flash. I mean, it's quick. It's a fleeting glimpse, but it, it, it's a shell color, and I remember seeing some kind of white. It was a vert. It was a clear vertical. It was clearly much taller, much bigger than him. And when I saw, remember, I got scared when you did that reenactment. I said, "Dude, we got to go." I don't want to be out here at dark because we were talking about we brought the night vision with us mm -hmm. and and see that was when he did the reenactment I mean it was starkly different his colors the OD colors and the tans just totally different than what I saw size wise color wise uh, agility wise they were both vertical both were vertical and both were on two it was clearly on two legs I saw two legs I saw it step from one to the bank I clearly saw two legs with light colored feet whiteness back here shell or slate color i don't remember seeing arms I, you know so i weigh i'm five nine i weigh 250. what would you 800 800 pounds seven and a half to eight feet tall easily 750 you know it was huge man it was huge oh we heard a huge rock get thrown right out there and we that's when we chased it up the mountain that was Thursday night. We, but we chased them up the mountain uh, because we heard a huge rock being, being thrown through those trees over there. Came back down, and that's when they threw the rocks, started throwing the rocks at us. And... Okay. We were talking about this. Do you think uh, the fact that the teepee's up is pissing them off? I think the fact that we're here is pissing them off. <laughs> that teepee wasn't here t uh, Sunday night when we ha had the tantrum thrown. The teepee didn't get here till, till um, Monday night. Okay, so the tantrum... Would... Tantrum was when he and I were here on Sunday night. Okay. Uh, we heard the big boulder. It was a big boulder, Volkswagen, whatever they threw. Something humongous, and it bounced around and made a terrible racket. We were inside the cabin, and we could hear it through the doors. And I was thinking about sleeping in a tent out. Oh, I wouldn't recommend that. I, t I talked Paul out of it. Uh, you might... I, told, I, I talked Paul out of it because I didn't feel safe doing it. I didn't... 
I didn't well, if I put a tent inside there, that would the tent would give a level of protection from a rock. Then I may do that. We're going to be kind of crowded later this week. And, so make um, sure you got a good weapon with you. Yeah. Because they will, they do come up at night. I promise you, they come up at night. We've seen them. They're here. They're throwing rocks at us. So just keep that in mind. Can't wait. Okay. <laughs> now, Ken had just shown up when he took that. So, uh, this is a point of, of different, different, I have a point of difference with my friend Daryl. I'm not sure that everything that we observe is, is get out of here. I think that like any other group of primates, they all have, they all have a different role in the group, and I think they all have a different point of view in the group. I think some of them are more precocious and playful because they're young. I think some of them are up and comers who are trying to demonstrate how powerful they are. They're not dominants, but they'd like to be. So maybe they do a little more, and I think Mark's experience could have been with an animal like that. I think that other animals are already the dominant, and they just want you to see them. I am big, I am bad, and I am in charge. So I'm not sure that everything we experience is the result of stress or aggression. I think some of it is pure curiosity and playfulness. I don't think it can all be I don't think every everything can be put in the same in the same bucket. So the next, the next, whoops, um, no, 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 this, this is about to us. Okay. This is Bravo Team. Um, I was on Bravo Team. There were five of us. Four of us saw two wood apes run up a hill. Um, you're going to hear, this is, so what we started to do now is we started to record an interview with, if, if you have a sighting, if you have a, a direct visual sighting, we try to record you relating that event as quickly as possible. And in the case of this one, this video was made minutes after this happened. We saw what we saw. That took three, four, five seconds stops. And then we spent the next two hours just going, do you, can you believe what we saw? But we, we, uh, we, we, we taped it. So you're going to hear, these are raw, raw retail. This is, this is the first time we've actually talked about what we've seen to each other. There is a little bit of dirty language in here, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Motions are running high. I'm in this video. People have made fun of what I said. I, I think I was being pretty honest. Kathy Strain is in this video. Mark McClurkin's in this video. Ken Stewart is shooting this video. Um, we heard the rapid movement, and I looked, and I could just see this black thing that was huge running up the side of the... Kind of, kind of, point, with, kind of point with your finger. Right where I had originally okay. saw it. It just went right up the hillside. It was lower. It, it was started lower? out lower, no. like it came down to the edge. Is what I, I saw it. At, saw black at the edge mm -hmm. down here below where you saw it first. I didn't see it until it started going really fast up the hill. I heard the movement, like it was moving. We heard the movement. And then it, it was clearly in the opening, and then it just ran up the side. And I can't tell if it was using its hands or not, but it was really beefy, like it was just pumping it on so as fast as anything. I, I saw seen. two legs cross. So and it was I never, huge. I didn't see the top how, of it till it was in the how long did you I'm, see it? Like 1,000? 1, 1, 1, 3, 1, 3, 3 seconds. I saw two movements, two pieces of movement, two black things went up that mountain. When you guys reacted, I saw two things. The thing I saw was up higher, and I, I could not see the top of it by the time I saw it. And it's, I, it looked like legs crossing, like a person, if you can only see the knee down, like legs crossing. And then when it got up here, it, there, it was whatever it was. It, I don't know what else it could have been. It was. It looked like it was on upright, but whatever it was was super thick. What? It crossed right across there. You see this? Yeah, I see that little clearing up there. It crossed right there. Why were they there? That was close when we heard that. That was right there. That was right fucking there. Why were they there? Or sorry, break this other side. Okay, right and just this one. Thick stuff. Just one. I didn't see two. I saw one. And it was okay. God, it was thick. What was the um, vertical height of the section you saw, Mark? I didn't see it. Four and a half feet. It looked like to me like you it saw was four and a half forward. feet. About, I didn't yeah, see it, it standing. Slope. I saw that it was sloped, like it was running at when full it was speed going up. up hill, right. What I saw, the legs were clearly going uphill, and it, it crossed. And what hit here was moving, still moving fast, and I, I could see at least four and a half feet vertical. 
think you saw the top of it? I saw I, I saw the whole thing. I saw all of it moving. And it moved like a person bent over going up a steep okay. slope. So not like a, on all fours. Mm -hmm. It was like going like this. So it'd be hard to tell because it wasn't. It was definitely 100%, uh, 100% black. Totally black. Be careful what you wish for. Is it bigger than me? I think so. Height-wise, but width-wise, it's hard to tell because it was moving so fast. I mean, I was so astonished by its, by its speed. Because you can see 30 yards down the cut. It had to. I saw dark, and I saw light, and it appeared as though that they were like one was behind the other. One went forward, one went ahead, one went ahead, then they went shoom, and it's like they were on a cable being drawn up. Just the mountain just whoom, just. Yeah, that's exactly up. right. Like just they're just being up. pulled up. We're just straight up. Were they so the, the same? Were they the same size, or were they uh, different from, sizes? From where, from my vantage point, I, uh, the trees, uh, the canopy was blocking. If they were upright, they were blocking the upper half. Um, so, so Bob, would, if you were like to do one thousand one, one thousand two, how how long did you sit? Uh, two. Okay. Two seconds. And you saw it about, about three, three seconds. I saw it about two seconds. Yeah, just a couple okay. seconds. Well, so the second one I saw about two seconds. It was it was not bounding. The, no. The feet no. was not bounding. Uh, like an ant, like the, a... The, you could see the feet going back and forth, propelling itself up the hill. Correct. That's what I saw. And That's it was I incredibly smooth. But it was incredibly smooth and fast. Right. And it looked as though it was running downhill, but it was running very steeply uphill. Right. Okay. No noise. As, as smoothly as somebody would run a downhill. Yes. Right. A, a streak of motion that was dark, and then I saw the smaller one, which was obviously black. I saw that thing just sliding up there. I mean, there it is. That was an ox sliding down. Yeah, you got it shook up. Good job. Why don't you come on down for a party? Is that what you wanted? You want to see us run around? Throw a rock. I see no movement. I don't see it now. It moves between the trees. I saw a sparkle. I turned on my night vision so I could get in there, and by the time I got it up to my eye, the sparkling was gone, but I saw light in there. I had a full upright. It was a full upright visual. He moved to the right. Moved to the right. Mark, do you want your AK? No. Okay, your AK was higher than I saw my sparkle. What I saw? Step up here where I'm at, Ryan. Right in there. You saw it up there? What I saw up there was a full visual. Full frontal visual. You see the gap in the trees up there? I do. Where there's a little light? I do. That's where it walked across. It stopped. It swung into it. And then, then it's it moving back to, right. to its left or moving to the right? It moved to its left or right. Come it was on. Looking down the hill. It went this way. I'm losing light. God, we've got no light and night vision's useless up there. The thermal's useless up there. Guys, it's not coming down. It's a bold hoaxer to step back out in front of it out of the right bolt with a slope on it. Um, this is uh, this is Mark McCurkin recounting, um, actually several weeks after this event took place. It's going to get very dark here in a second. Apparently, uh, this is Mark recounting um, what happened to him in the creek. Um, this is when he clucked back. That's all he did. He clucked back. This is where the OP1 was was set up. So, Mark, what was the direction that you heard? The clucking and the growl and right here, facing down the creek. I had one cluck coming from back in here to our uh, west southwest, 
Just to the just to the south of the creek, but to the west. Due south of the creek to my west. And I had another one back in here clucking. So they were a ways apart from each other. They were a good ways apart from each other. A good 60 yards, maybe 75. And uh, the one that crossed first crossed behind me, right back here. About 35 yards. Yep, right behind. You see where the edge drops off back there? Yep. Right behind that. Okay. And I heard it clearly walk across the rocks. And that's when I called radio that y'all had one coming your way. And here in a little bit later, I expected them to stop making the sounds because one had left. And uh, then the sound started back up. And I listened to them go back and forth for a little while. And I clucked my tongue. And I'm still facing this way, straight down the creek. And I heard the growl when I did it. And the growl came just to the left of this largest tree near the bank. The, the tree right above the, uh, the deadfall log yes. that goes at a 45? Okay. Yeah, about a 7, 8 inch diameter tree there. Okay, so I've got that in the middle of my video. Okay. And I heard the growl back there and I heard rustling and that's when I called y'all on the radio to asked you to come get me. And uh, Brian said I called y'all twice. I, I only remember the one time. But that tree... It's closest to the bank, and you can see a smaller tree to the left, and then another big one beside it. Let's see. Let me make sure I've got this. So there's a, the tree that's closest uh -huh. right there. If you look to its left, about 10 feet back, there's another smaller tree, about a 3-inch diameter, right next to a big tree. Yes, got it, got it, good. That's where the sound was coming from, and that's when I started hearing the brush popping. And you can see a good ways back in there. Uh-huh. I could see the top of the branches whipping. And when it got to about, not those trees, but about two further back. Keep going back, Alex. Right about there is where I got a visual. Okay. It was because it was just slapping everything out of the way. All right, do you see this biggest tree on the bank, Alex? Come right to it, just exactly like that. Except about five times as fast and about a foot taller. And so when did, it, when did it stop? The tree he pushed aside just then, the one that's about an inch and a half in diameter. Go back. It's on your left. Your left. The one, the one right behind you. Right there. That's where it stopped. Which way did it go? It just kind of slid to a stop right there and went straight back the way it came. So... You, you stood up while it was still coming was, towards you. Yeah, it was still running, and all I could do was stand up and swing my gun around that direction because my feet were tangled up under my chair here, and the blind was touching the front of my toes here. So I couldn't stand without falling forward or backwards, so my knees were still bent, and I just kind of swung and popped one off, and then it was like here, 7 o'clock or something. It wasn't quite 7 o'clock, 6.30. Was he stopping at the same moment that you were standing, or, or did he stop when you fired? Or? It, it happened so fast I couldn't tell you, because it only, I mean, you're talking five or six seconds, because it was, I caught a visual from that tree back there where Alex started. That's the first visual I saw, and it was just slapping that brush with both hands out of its way. And uh, it, was, it was hauling it, and it... Uh, so I don't know if it was stopped when I stood. So had it not stopped, it would have taken a leap from that bank. And landed over here right in my pocket. It happened so fast that, I mean, I, I couldn't even untangle myself with my feet together like this underneath me. I couldn't untangle from the blind in the chair. Now that's, to be honest, that's what scared me the worst is there wasn't a damn thing I could do. I could, didn't even have time to shoulder my gun. I just shot from my hip. And yeah. being that far behind me... It was at a 45 degree angle to your back. Pretty close, yeah. yeah. So the, the thing that I've heard lots of people say, as, as I've read reports, as you've all read reports, and you've heard, you've heard people recount their stories, is they're so fast. I heard it a hundred times. They're so fast. You just skip over that. You want to hear about how big they were. 
all that kind of stuff. They are so fast. I'm telling you that you cannot believe how fast these things are. When we saw it go up the hill, two, three seconds, that was 30 yards up a rock-strewn hillside that it takes me a minute to get up. I'm in good shape. I'm just trying not to break an ankle. I got it up in seconds. This thing was on him in five seconds. They are so fast. Oops, there we go. So, uh, against Daryl's advice, Jerry Heston decided to sleep in a tent. And uh, you can see his tent, actually, in the video. So you'll, know, you'll see how far away he was. Right behind him in the video is where the cabin is. So he's not that far away from the cabin. I think Jerry is one of our more skeptical members. I mean, was. Jerry's the kind of guy, was, was. He's the kind of guy who needs to have it happen to him, which is commendable. You can listen to what he says and decide if he's on which side of the fence he's in. I heard something come down from the mountain, and I just thought, I don't know what it is. It could be a deer, it could be a fox, it could be an armadillo, for all I know. Mm-hmm. And it come down there and moved around, and then it just started moving right through here, just like a swishing sound like it was walking through tall grass and it moved pretty quick and it got over to that big tree right there and it stopped and then pretty darn quick it, it moved all the way across all the way down there pretty darn quick within four seconds I would say it moved from there to there and it stopped and waited down there till the wind started blowing again and I guess it crossed because I didn't hear it cross but then I heard some movement over there coming this way well, the wind was blowing from the east, and I hadn't smelled anything up to that time. But all of a sudden, I started getting these whiffs of wet horse. I was just laying there. I thought, well, it's quit. It's gone off. And something growled right there. And it's just a low, guttural growl. I've never heard that growl. All the TV shows, all the documentaries I've seen, I've never heard a growl like that. After that, I heard four wood knocks over here just bam, 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 bam. Same location? Yeah, it was over here and something was over there. And then off in the distance, I heard it sounded like somebody hitting on a wood block. Yeah. Just a light, ting, 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 ting. It wasn't meta- metallic. Did it, come, did it come from the east over here where that sweet gum tree yeah. is? Yeah, yeah, it came from over there. And then I heard like a, a falc monster scream, like 100, 150 yards away in the same area, the, the wood block sound. And I was thinking, man, this is great, you know, if it'll just step out. And I'm thinking it, I thought Mark was awake, and then it growled right in here somewhere. The combination of something moving that close, tree knocks, howl, growls, it, it, it sounded, I didn't know what it was till it started back from that tree, and it was, and I thought, oh man, that's, that's about people. So, um, yeah. Heard it walking up there. Now, he says he heard it swish, swish, swish like it was going through grass. There is grass up there. There's grass on that ledge. Uh, very easily could have been hearing it walk through that grass. The, the distance that he said it moved in four or five seconds is tens of yards, 50, 60 yards in four or five seconds. They do that math. That's how fast they are. Oops. Quiet, Jerry. Ken Helmer, I mean, I'll, just, I'll just let it play. This is, this is one of the more incredible um, encounters we've had down there. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just let him, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Ken say it. Okay, Sawbones, tell us what happened on the night of the 18th, about what time it was, and, and what happened. 1.30 a.m., I'd say. Um, I went into this uh, cabin, or into this room here. Um, the windows have been taken out, and there's just screens there. None of some of the screens have been uh, opened up, you know, was in case we needed to, you know, get something out of it real quick as in a gun. In any case, I went to sleep, and before I went to sleep, I made sure I pulled all the screens down to the edge of the sill, uh, mostly because I just didn't want something looking in at me, just in case they did that. You know, we've had the cabins smashed two or three times. I went to sleep, and uh, just before I fell asleep, I remember turning on my left side, and I was sleeping just in the middle of the bed about 
So you were, you were facing away from the window? I was facing away from the window, um, probably three feet from the window, I'd say probably about, you know, that far, so. And I went to sleep, and uh, next thing I remember, I was having a dream about uh, one of my cousins, and then my dream was interrupted with something touching me on the hip. So if I'm on my side like this, something put its hand on my hip and pushed me away from the window. And then I immediately became awake. And then I felt something touch a little lower down, like on my side here, and I thought it kind of pulled me back towards the window. So I immediately became conscious. But because I was in a dream state, I was still in REM sleep. Not REM sleep, but I was still experiencing the paralysis that uh, goes on with REM sleep. So whenever you sleep, you you, know, you don't act out your dreams, and everybody has a disconnect between their brain and their muscles. So I was trying to get away. You know, now I'm, I'm awake. I've been pushed, and I feel something touch me again and kind of pull me back a little bit. And I'm trying to get away from the window, and of course I can't. So I start. Next thing I know, I start screaming for help. But when you're in that state, you can't scream as well. So I'm sort of this low moans coming out of me, calling for for uh, Daryl and Mike trying to get help, telling them that I've been pushed, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, come help me. And that went on for, gosh, I don't know how long, 20 seconds. Of course, I'm terrified because nobody's answering my call. Uh, I guess Daryl had uh, woken up and he heard me. He thought I was kind of screwing around. Um, <clears throat> and then the paralysis of the REM sleep, of course, you know, went away, and then I jumped up real quick, and then said some explicitives about what, what in the, you know, what was that? And Daryl says, you're just dreaming, Sawbones. Go back to sleep. And I said, no, sir, I wasn't dreaming. I'd gotten pushed. Of course, you know, then we all start talking about it. And we're, you know, I'm freaking out about this. And I just can't believe what just happened. And I'm sitting there going over my mind. Um, you know, and it's just weird. And I, I don't know how long we talked, maybe five or <clears throat> five minutes or so. Well, then I had to go to pee, so I walked to the other side of the cabin to go in the restroom. And, you know, of course there's no electricity, so I had my red headlamp on. And the door to that bathroom has been broken a little bit, you know, being an old cabin. And so I had to sort of step to the right to get in, and then step back left. And as I stepped in, I saw my reflection of the, you know, the red headlight in the mirror. Or not in the mirror, but in the glass window that I was looking outside. And then down to the left, there are these two green eyes that were looking straight at me. And as my headlights came into that window, they just turned and zipped away. And at first, I wasn't sure what had just happened. And I said, what? I did not just see green eyes. You know, green eyes shine. And I tried to see if I could replicate that with the headlamp. Of course, I couldn't. The headlamp was clearly red, and it was up here in the top right corner for me. Um, you know, the other way for you guys, if you're watching this. This was down here, and it just turned and went away. And it was right there at the trail. There's a big trail that is just well beaten down. It looks like cattle have been walking through that trail. And this trail runs for about 100 yards. It comes straight to the cabin right there and ends. You think that's one area where they come and they'd like to throw rocks at the, at the cabin um, because there's a clear clearing there, and they can get in there and get out of there real quick. Of course, that's the same spot that we'd seen the green eye shine reflection uh, about four weeks ago now, the one that stood up. So, anyways, now you know. So there was one sitting outside that window, and I don't know if it was the same one, but it certainly took off real quick. Tell I, about what were the? How big were the eyes? How high off the ground would you estimate? There, I would say about uh, a dollar, dollar coin size. They were probably this far apart. You know, I don't know how many in inches. Of course, when you're looking, they illuminate even a little bit brighter. And they were just two of them, and they. Turned off to the right, just like that, almost immediately as I got my headlamp on it. And it turned that way, and it went. And it was probably, you know, I'm sitting down now, but if I stand up, I would say about this high off the ground. So my impression was whatever it was was either down and on all fours or squatting. Um, about how far from the cabin would you say it was? It um, wasn't very far, probably 20 feet. And how, 
as far as that trail that empties out there, proximity-wise, how close would the animal have been to the? Oh, just right on the edge of the trail, five okay. feet. Yeah. My impression was he turned to the right and went right down that trail. Because immediately after it occurred, I, of course, came out of the cabin, you know, barefoot in the underwear, and there was, <laughs> it was gone. You know, I, I, I highlighted, I, you know, turned on the uh, flashlights and looked all around. Uh, couldn't see couldn't see anything. You know, of course, there's brush all around the cabin, so you can't see very far in it. And I wasn't quite dressed to go in after it. I won't sleep in that bedroom anymore. Um, let's talk about the eye shine. We had three, um, that I can think of, notable eye shine events right there at the cabin. That was one of them. The first team, I think it was the first or second night that they were in there. Uh, they were sitting around. They were pretty casual. They weren't expecting much to happen. And uh, it was night, and they were away from the fire. And, uh, you know, the vehicles were sort of arrayed around where they were. And uh, they saw a reflection from a little ways away from them. And uh, at first they thought it was the reflector from one of their, uh, one of their vehicles. But when they looked at it, uh, it was, I believe it was green, and it was, as, as, as Ken describes here, perfectly round, perfectly round reflections, like that. And as they were looking at it, there were three or four guys looking at it. It rose up off the ground about this high to about that high and it took off towards the mountain, as did our guys. Uh, they may have seen it real quickly as it was going up the mountain. Again, fast, up the mountain, gone. That was 15, 20 feet from where they were sitting. Not very far from where he saw that eye shine. I saw some eye shine, other side of the cabin, up on the hill, uh, perfectly round again, perfectly round, like a silver dollar in a bush. Uh, we had decided, Ken Stewart and myself, that we were going to approach this bush because there was something with shiny eyes in it. Now this thing, it was, there was somebody by the cabin and we were away from them and it was sort of up the hill in between us. And when I saw it, it was looking at me and I hit it with my flashlight and that's why I saw the eyes. And, and, I, and I did what I will not do next time. I'm like, I said something. I said, I have eye shine. And uh, then, it, then they made a lot of noise and I could see the eyes go like that. These were two round eyes on a flat face. And you could see the reflection go from looking at me to looking at the other guys to looking back at me. Like it was like, are, what, are they, what are they going on about? <laughs> what are they talking about? But I have my flashlight on it. And then it seemed to realize, it looked back and forth several times, and then it just put its head down like that. You just watched those eyes, those perfectly round, flat eyes go straight down. It didn't take off. It took us a second to realize that. Ken pointed out like, well, whatever it is, it's still in there because it didn't leave that bush. And uh, we decided, well, we're going to go up there. We're going to go get whatever's in that bush. We're going to chase it out of there. And as we were going up the hill, and we hadn't gone 10 feet, we heard this growl, not from the bush, from further up the mountain, a little bit to our right. And it was deep, it was like, kind of a sound. That's not even deep enough. And whatever it was seemed to be suggesting that we should not keep going up the hill. So uh, we decided that discretion is the better part of valor. In that case, it was getting dark. Couldn't really see all that well, so we decided not to proceed up the hill. But I shine. Their eyes shine. I don't know that they glow. That's not what we're saying. What we see is reflection, clearly reflection. I did not see the eyes in that bush until I hit it with a flashlight. Ken didn't see the reflection until he walked in and his light reflected. They're very reflective. They look like they're shining. They look like they're a light because they're reflecting light so well. The animal that they saw rise up off the ground from three feet to eight feet, um, similarly, was very bright, probably reflecting the firelight. So Ken tells you how he was pushed through the window. Um, so we're smart. We said, hey, well, you know, there's a screen. There's a hole in the screen. Big old hairy arm comes through. There might be hair on that screen. We should check that out. And there was, it turns out there was a lot of hair on that screen. We collected several, several strands of hair. Um, this is actually on our website. If you go to our website uh, at woodape.org, you'll find uh, a write-up of this. But there was one hair of all the hairs we collected that was interesting to us. It didn't look like the rest of them. The rest of them were either clearly raccoon hair 
or there were other hair we couldn't identify, but d did not fit the profile of what has been described in the past as lineate hair, and was probably more raccoon hair. Um, this hair, as it says here, uh, was reddish brown. The others were a slightly different color. It was about six inches long. It had no medulla, and I'll point that out to you here. The medulla is the part of the hair that has color in it, and typically it runs through the center of the hair. You'll see it in one of these pictures of it. You'll see it. It's, sometimes it's broken up, sometimes it's solid, but it's very typical of animal hair. It's not typical of hair that people think come from wood apes. So this hair had no medulla. It did have a bulbous tip, like the root of it was bulbous. Sorry, the root was bulbous. Looked kind of like that. That's where it would have been planted in the skin of whatever animal it came out of. And the end of it was not broken, it wasn't cut, it was frayed. So this is an old hair. This hair had been on the animal that it came from for a while because the end of it got all beat up, you can see it. So we thought that was interesting. And uh, you heard uh, uh, Professor Melvin talk about the uh, Sykes study, the DNA study. Brian Sykes has that hair. We don't know what that came from. It's very possible it came from whatever pushed Ken Helmer. But we don't know exactly what that is. And the only way you can really know what a hair is is by looking at its DNA. So that hair is with Brian Sykes. We don't have the results of that study. So we don't know what that hair was yet. We hope to be finding that out. And as soon as we do, no matter what he says, we're going to publish the results. So if he says that it was another raccoon hair, okay, that's what the DNA says. You can't argue with the DNA. We've also found tracks, as I showed you earlier. This is a video of finding a track. This is the last team. I believe it's the last team. Is the last team? Close, close to the end of the operation. Um, we found this track uh, in, in the road. And the, the nice thing about this video is that, as I said earlier, you can't often see these things in the, the shallow nature that they are in this area. But in this one, I think it's pretty clear. It looks like we have an ape track. I'm going to guess that's probably 13, 14 inches heel, toes, comes down like this. Just the one track, it's all pretty dry. But Trace it with your finger again, Daryl. So. Toes, down to the heel, just like that. The toes are pretty straight across, it looks yep. like. Just like that. Then the heel is down here. I don't have a tape measure, but I'm gonna give you something for scale. Mm -hmm. Put your there you go. Six RP two twenty six heel right there. This gun's approximately seven and a half, eight inches in length. So that's probably fourteen, thirteen to fourteen inch track. Here's my hand. How wide do you, would you guess? Oh, up here is six inches. Down here, four. Okay. Like the one good piece of dirt that would have taken a track. All right, out. So, Professor Melvin carries a pocket scale, and uh, Daryl carries a six-hour P226. <laughs> so, there's this famous quote from Don Rumsfeld, and, and uh, what he said is, is kind of a joke, because he had an interesting way of talking. Uh, but but the, the quote, I think, is really applicable to what, to what we do. He says, there are known knowns, things that we know. We also know that there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we do not know. That's, that's prophetic. That's deep stuff. But I, I get what he's talking about in, in a weird roundabout way. So what do we know? What are the known knowns? Well, we know they're there. And, I, and I'll tell you again, I, there's two options. Either they're there or we're lying. There's nothing in between. It is not hoaxers. It is not bears. It's not coyotes. 
It's not an escaped orangutan from the zoo. It is either a wood ape and his friends messing with us, or we are liars. That's it. You can decide for yourself which of those two spectrums it is. You saw what that environment looks like. You, you see what that, what that is like to move on, the rockiness of the soil. Trying to imagine being a hoaxer in that scenario. It, it's, it's more impossible to imagine, for me anyway, than to say that it's a, a, a previously undescribed primate. A group of them live there. At least one group. I don't think that they're unique. You know, some of the stories you hear Lyle talking about just a minute ago, actually an hour ago, uh, if, if you know of the Eight Canyon incident, there are other examples of stories that aren't unlike what we've experienced. Not to the extent, not for the duration that we've experienced them. But this is not unique behavior in the literature. Uh, it, it's not common, but it's not unique. So I don't think this is the only place in the world like this. There may be other area X's in the Washita's. There may be a number of area X's all over the country. But I think that what we need to figure out is what makes this place special. They're very intelligent. They're furtive. I like that word furtive because you hear this idea, well, in fact, if you watch Finding Bigfoot, one of the things Renee always says, well, why would an animal that's trying to hide from humans do that? Well, we don't know they're trying to hide. In some cases, one of our, some of our sightings are, they want you to see them. Mark McClurkin had a sighting of the gray one where it stood there, turned around, and walked away from him in no hurry. This animal was not afraid. He did not care, or she did not care, that it was being seen. And it knew it was being seen because he had a headlight and it was illuminated. He knew that it was there. It knew that he was there. And it knew that he knew it was there. And it just walked off calmly. So they're furtive. They don't want to be out in the open. They're not trying to be out in the open, but they're not always going to run away and hide if we show up. They're large. They're really big. They're mostly upright. They're covered in hair. They're often curious. They're very strong. If what we hear them throwing around is any indication, and they should be fast. They're really good at using their cover. Really good. Bob Strain has the story of... Uh, looking into a bush where Kathy Strain had told him she saw some, some movement. She saw a branch being pulled aside and then released. And he looked in there, and he saw three logs laying in the bushes. This was just before our sighting of them running up the hill. The next day, we went over there with him, and he was recreating what he did, because that's where they came from, and they were not there when he looked. He put his head in there, and he said, and I looked in there, and he's like, well, how many logs do you see in there? There was one log. He said there were three logs. He told us specifically that there were two or three logs. We looked in there, there was one log. We think they were lying in there pretending to be logs. It was kind of dark. He thought they'd be logs. He didn't think they'd be laying there like a log. So it wasn't what he expected. They're very good at using cover. They like to throw things. They like to hit trees. They do work together. As I said, you'll often experience some sort of you know, something will distract you, will, will, will draw your attention, you'll be interested in a point for a certain reason, something will have happened there, and then when you focus on that, you will have a rock thrown from another area. They're, they're coordinating, Either they're not necessarily coordinating, but they are reacting to the situation in a tactical way. The, the, you have to be careful of saying, whether are they being strategic or tactical, there's a difference. Um, the, this, is, this, is, this is tactics. This is, my friend is being, has been seen, so I'm going to throw a rock and draw them away. They can make all kinds of weird sounds. They're different colors. We've seen the gray one. And it's either multiple really big gray ones or one really big gray one. But we've seen the big gray one. We've had at least three members that I can think of see the gray one, possibly four. Uh, we saw the big black one. We've seen the big black one several times or multiple big black ones. We've seen smaller black ones. We've seen sort of reddish brown ones. So there's a, there's a variable color uh, going on there. And if you look at orangutans, for instance, there's lots of color range in orangutans, too. All the same colors I just said, except for maybe black. I'm not sure there are black orangutans. They're not solitary. You hear this a lot. I'm not saying none of them are solitary. There's entirely, it's entirely possible. If you look at gorillas as, as a parallel, gorillas will often leave their group and be solitary for a while. So there may be solitary wood apes, but they are not just always solitary, not like orangutans. Orangutans are often solitary. That's how they want to live. They come together to mate, and then they are solitary again. Not these. 
They're not necessarily nocturnal. They own the night. They can see very well at night, we believe. They're very hard to see at night. They operate at night. But we've had many activities when the sun was up. We've heard rocks thrown when the sun was up. We've seen them when the sun was up. So they're not just active at night. They're not nomadic. They don't leave this area. We've been in this area, as I said, for more than 10 years. And there's been activity and sightings from this area since before that. Um, in the past two years, because we changed our tactics, we've had incredible experiences. They've not gone anywhere. This is one of my problems with this idea that they're trying to chase us out. They're, they don't leave. I, now, I don't know why they're there or why they don't leave, but they don't leave. They're not nomadic. Very fast, very agile. And their eyes are very reflective. What do we think we know? We think they act a lot like chimps. Chimps are very tactical animals. They work in groups. They do have some strategy, and they think ahead. They collect rocks for purposes that they're going to use later on. Um, th th there are some analogs to chimps. What, what, what Daryl has said is if you had to ask him on a scale, it's like 60% chimp, 40% ape. I mean, it, it's, it's some, there are some attributes of them that are kind of ape-like. There are some attributes of them that are sort of chimp-like. They have excellent night vision, we believe. We think they're highly territorial. They don't go anywhere, so that would make sense. They're not easily scared away. Even if you're trying to get one, they don't, they don't, they don't leave. They may avoid game cameras. It's also possible that game cameras just don't work very well. You know, it, it's, it's a difficult uh, environment there. It's often hot and humid when we're trying to use them. They work by detecting heat. Um, so either you get thousands of pictures of the same bush just moving in the sun, um, or you get nothing at all. We've actually had the times when we've walked up on these cameras ourselves to service them. They don't take pictures of us walking up on them. We've had, uh, we've observed bears uh, moving in front of our cameras that we've later, later gone to look at those cameras and they do not have pictures of bears on them. So they don't always work. So do they avoid the cameras? Do they know when the cameras are on and they stay away from them just because they, they don't trust them for whatever reason? Or is it a combination of them being very wary and the cameras just sucking? I think it's that. Oops, wait a minute, I didn't want to do that, sorry. They follow us, we've had a, a member who was driving out in his truck, his truck got a flat tire on the way out, it's a very difficult road, and as he came back, he was tracked back to the cabin, he was tracked for quite a ways, he could hear the animal shadowing him off just far enough so he couldn't see it. They will follow humans, they will follow their vehicles. We've had sightings way up, out, away from our area where we believe that they've followed the truck out. They're very curious about us. They seem to be very, very curious about us. And we don't think they're good at tracking multiple targets. If, if we break up and move into independent teams, uh, we don't think they're very good at keeping track of that. The known unknowns, the things that we just don't know. What is their social structure? As I said, it, it, you can infer an ape-like quality of their social structure, but we don't know for sure. Why won't they leave that area? Why do they like that area? It's not unlike the next valley over, you know, or the valley after that. It's just as remote, it's just as rugged, but they don't leave that area. Why don't they? We don't know. We don't exactly know how they avoided being captured on, on any of our photographic equipment. We don't know how many they are. At least four, at least six, somewhere in there. Just based on the, when we have encounters, you can hear different animals moving. So at least a handful. It's kind of like if you have a mouse in your house, you probably have 20 mice in your house. You know? So we don't know if, if four equals 20 or four equals four. What do they eat? We don't know. We haven't found chewed plants like you will where apes live. We haven't found half-eaten carcasses. What do they eat? They don't, maybe they eat the rocks. There's plenty of rocks there, but I don't think so. Where do they bed? The last time I was there, we found an area that was suggestive of a group of large animals lying in an area. But I wouldn't say it was a bed. Um, but where do they bed? We don't know. We've not found where they sleep. Where gorillas sleep, you, it's perfectly obvious where gorillas sleep when you find that. It's obvious where deer sleep, for that matter. But we've not found an obvious area where these things sleep. Now, these are often some of the things that skeptics will ask us. Well, you don't find their beds, you don't find their food. No, we don't. But I think you've seen that we have plenty of other reason to suspect they're there. We just can't explain these things. That doesn't mean that they're a huge red flag. It's just, it's just a question that we have. So that's the end of what I have. 
Um, as I said, and as I've said in the past, I, I really don't think there's, there's more than a couple of, of scenarios that are at work here. I, I can't fathom that we are being hoaxed from the outside. I mean, you've seen what, what I've shown you. you. You've seen what we've experienced. You know what we're doing in there. You know what our goals are. But it continues to happen. So I cannot believe that we are being hoaxed. So that leaves us with maybe three other options. Maybe it's mis mis misidentification, misinterpretation. Rocks are being thrown. Rocks are being thrown. What can throw a rock? You kind of have to have a thumb and a hand to throw a rock. Bears can't throw rocks. Raccoons can throw very small rocks. So I don't think we're mis misinterpreting what's happening to us. So the only other two things that are left is we're either lying to you and the world or everything we say is true. And there is in the valley in Oklahoma where a group of wood apes live and have lived and will interact with humans. Those are the choices. And I guess I can just leave it up to you to decide for yourself what you think is actually happening there. And that's it. I'm done. Thank you.